I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Galatians in chapter 5. You'd be surprised how many times I hear people say that the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ did not have the same gospel message. I've often wondered, did Jesus ever really give a good debate on eternal security? I mean, you know, he says a verse like John 3, 16, and we say that proves eternal security. And about knowing that you have eternal life, and that's eternal security. But I think I found just the right portion of Scripture that verifies that people were offended at Jesus Christ for teaching eternal security. And that's where most of his persecution came from. Because his message was not the message of the Pharisees. Those people that believed you had to keep the law to be saved. Trying to earn your way to heaven by your good works. Putting confidence in the flesh. The Apostle Paul says he puts no confidence in the flesh because he knew that salvation was not by the things that we do. So here in the book of Galatians, as he's presenting a treatise on the gospel itself, he says, if I preach what the others preached, why do they persecute me? If I'm preaching the same thing they're preaching, that you had to keep the law. And so he was telling them that um, you don't have to keep the law and being circumcised under the law was a sign of confidence in the flesh. So he made the statement here in verse 11 of chapter 5. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Because there was a time in Paul's life where he did. But that was because it was under the law. And he found out, lo and behold, he was saved by grace. And he began his new birth with a birth by the Holy Spirit, which is by faith alone and not by the law. He said, if I was preaching that salvation is by what you do, and keeping the law and being circumcised, said, why am I persecuted then? What caused Paul's problem is that he was preaching eternal security without it. You can be saved forever and not by your works. It's not by the things that you do. That it truly was the gift of God. Take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. In John, John chapter 4 makes an interesting statement here. And I want you to see this because Jesus is the one who brings up this issue. He brought it up with Nicodemus in chapter 3 that you had to be born again. And then he talks here in verse 11, Jesus answered and said unto her, the woman who came and met him at the well, uh, she had five husbands and was living with another man that was not her husband. And Jesus knew this. And she was a Samaritan. So why would a Jew go to see these Samaritans, which they considered to be half-breeds, and uh, didn't want anything to do with them? So she was kind of surprised that even a Jewish man would talk to her at, at a well about this um, little question in verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now there's as clear as you can get. If you knew who I was, that's why you heard me say, you've got to know who Jesus is. If you knew who I was, and who it is that said to thee, give me to drink, you would have asked, and you would have received. And that's how simple it is. Ask, receive. Whatever it is you're supposed to ask for, you can receive. But it has to be from somebody who can deliver. Jesus Christ is God, and he can give 
eternal life to whosoever believeth. So now you look over there in uh, verse 31. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And so while his disciples were gone into town, it doesn't say they reached anybody. It doesn't say they reached anybody. They may not have. But then they might have won a couple. There was only 12 of them. And um, while they were doing their thing, Jesus was doing his thing. He said, I have meat to eat that you don't know about. Something that satisfies the will of him that sent him. That's all he cared about. But now notice what he says in verse 32. I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another. <coughs> Hath any man brought him out to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye there are yet four months, then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Now he's talking about people, and of course you knew that. And he that reapeth receiveth wages. In other words, God says, If you become a soul winner, I'll pay you wages. It has been amazing to me that over the years, uh, 55 or so, I have seen God bless me through the people that I've reached for the Lord. That letter I just wrote to you, that's just somebody I reached 50 years ago. And there's another man that's out there, and he watches our broadcast, and he's virtually keeping us on the radio in Colorado. But he's somebody that I reached years and years ago. And you'd be surprised how sometimes the people who come sometimes to be great workers are those that you've either one or trained to, to serve the Lord. So there is a thing in the Word of God that uh, you'll receive wages. In other words, God's not asking you to do it for nothing. If you knew that God would pay you $1,000 for every soul you won to Christ, do you feel you might be called in full-time Christian work? Just liable to be called in. All of a sudden you say, I believe God's calling me into the ministry. If he only paid you a thousand, but I can guarantee you this. The value of one soul, he is going to give you more than what the whole world is valued at. What would you consider the world worth? And God is willing to pay you for, what if a man gains the whole world, loses his soul? In other words, the soul of man is worth more than the world. Than all the value in the world. And don't you think if God's going to pay you wages, not just now. But when you get to heaven and you see all those faces of people that you have reached throughout your life. I had a time to, on can you believe it, Christmas Day, restaurants were closed everywhere in Athens, Georgia. I couldn't find a place to eat except one little place was open, Waffle House. We used to call it Awful Waffle. So we're going to go to Waffle House. And because we went to Waffle House, lo and behold, we looked there, and there was a boy that used to come to ranch 20-something years ago when I was up in Georgia. And now he, he got married. And they're still married after all these years. I don't know how many years it was. Betty knows. I don't remember. Do you remember, hon, how many years they've been married? They had a couple of kids, two or three kids. And I'm sitting there, and I'm reading the paper. And this kid come over, and he looks up at me like this. He gets right in my face. And I'm reading the paper, and he gets right in my face. He says, do you remember me? And I looked at him, and CJ. I says, you're still alive. <laughs> and it's amazing, but he was reached because of ranch years ago. And now he's coming back to Northside since John John went back up here. He's, he's going to bring his whole family. I said, you get that whole family and get back in church. I said, you know better. And so he says, I'll do it. I'm doing it. I'm going. So he better be there today. I'm going to make a phone call. <laughs> but the fields are white already under harvest. But what I wanted you to see is the Lord pays wages because you're gathering fruit that will last forever. See, in this life, you can spend time, effort, and money and gain things in this world, but none of it's going to last. 
That's why he made the statement in verse 36. And gathered fruit last for eternity. The only thing that you can gather in this world that's going to last forever is going to be the soul that you won to Christ. But I've wondered about some of these things, and I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of John, chapter 6. John, chapter 6. Now, he says the, his goal is to finish the work that God had called him to do. Now, we know that when he said, it is finished on the cross, that was to pay for our sins. He came back again from the dead. But there's something else I want you to see here. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 6, look in verse 22. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one whereunto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with the disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, how did Jesus get on the other side of the lake? That was a good question. How did he get here? Because the disciples took the last boat. So they came on the other side, and lo and behold, there's Jesus. How'd you get here? Well, he, he's the Lord. He could have walked, or he could just close his eyes. You know, I'm there. <laughs> I mean, they can't forget who he was. But why did so many people follow him? You see, they were called disciples. That means they followed him. It has nothing to do with being saved, but they followed him. And then it says here in verse 23, Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread. After that, the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they came unto him, Rabbi, how'd you get here? When camest thou hither? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and you were filled. So it's not because of the miracles. Now, as John explains these miracles, they did miracles that the people might believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you would have life through his name. So they saw the miracles, but did not believe because of the miracles. Now, there's many miracles that are mentioned, but he says these are mentioned that you might believe that he is who he claimed to be. So they didn't believe he was who he claimed to be. They didn't believe the miracles. That it brought them to God. They were following, and Jesus says, because you were hungry and you got full. Then he says in verse 27, Now, I want you to notice that Jesus is going to explain to them eternal security. So he says in verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. In other words, you're laboring for something that cannot satisfy, and it doesn't last. But what I have satisfies, and it will last forever. You see, when you try to earn your salvation by your good works, you're laboring for something you can't have, it doesn't satisfy, doesn't guarantee you anything, because it depends upon your performance, which demands perfection. So he says, in verse 28, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? If, what, what's the works that we got to do? And so he said this. He answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. That's all that you had to do. But see, they wanted to do more than that. You see, these were disciples, followers of Christ, who believed in what they did. And they're following and trying to do the right thing. That would get them salvation. But he's trying his best, Jesus, explaining and giving them an example that would distinguish between man-made salvation and eternal salvation that God gives. Because there's people who are just bent on earning their way to heaven. They cannot buy the idea, cannot accept it that eternal life is freely a gift. They can't believe that. I've had people tell me, said, I'll never believe that in a million years. Well, they won't have to last that long. They'll, they'll know. So he says here, in verse 30, they said therefore unto him, what sign 
Showest thou then that we may see and believe thee. So they did not yet believe. What, what dost thou work? What, what are you going to do? Convince me. Do, um, do some magic trick. Well, how would you like feeding 4,000 or 6,000? Shouldn't that be a you know, pretty good little trick? So he says in verse 31, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Now, who do you think is this bread from heaven? Where was Jesus born? In Bethlehem. And Bethlehem means what? Nobody knows. House of bread. He is the bread from heaven. In verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now, here is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, answering their questions. And they can't get it. It's over their heads. They can't follow him. You see, when you want to know truth, you can see it. When you don't want to know truth, you can't see it. That's why he says, he that wants to do the will of God can know the will of God. But when you don't want to know the will of God, because you're not going to do the will of God, you're not going to know the will of God. Look what else he says. They said, then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Now, you think he's really after, or they're really after the, the bread like it was with manna? Because so you see there in verse 33, 30, uh, 30, uh, 3, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then they said, Give us this bread. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. You see, as he's talking about here, salvation is free and it lasts forever. Notice in verse 35, the eternal security. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. So him being bread and coming to him, as he says in the book of John chapter 1 and verse 12, he says that he giveth us the power to come to Christ and become the children of God. Because to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. You become a child of God when you accept Christ as your Savior. When he says you'll never hunger, that means if you eat this bread, you'll never hunger. It means you never have to do it again. That's eternal security. That means you are secure forever. It's not you have to eat this bread and keep eating this bread and eat it every day, all day long. Because when you stop eating, you die. See, that's not what he said. You eat this bread one time, one time, and you'll never thirst again. That is eternal security. And that's because you've taken of the bread of life, which is Christ. But if you try to labor for that which does not satisfy, and for the wrong kind of bread, you can't have this eternal bread. Look what else he says. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. <coughs> well, that's what he told the woman at the well. You'll have this water of life springing up inside of you. That is water that will satisfy. It's not drink this water and you have to keep drinking. It's just drink this water, you'll never thirst again. That means after that. That means you don't have to keep doing it. It means you don't have to do it tomorrow, and the next day, the next day, and the next day. When I trusted Christ as my Savior 58 and a half years ago, I've never had to have another drink. And the reason is because the drink that I had satisfied. I never have to have another drink. I never have to do it again. Because how many times can God give me the free gift of everlasting life? One time. And if you've got it, why does it have to do it to you again? You don't. And once you trust Christ as Savior, you're born into God's family. How many times do I have to be born in God's family? Just one time. And the rest of my life is about me growing in the Lord, but I only get into his family by birth. And that's the second birth. That's when you trusted Christ as your Savior. Look what else he says in verse 36. But I say unto you that ye also have sent me, that have sent me, and believe not. So there's those who have followed with him. They've 
ate the food and because he gave them some physical bread, but they didn't believe on him. They weren't trusting him for their salvation. There's a lot of people who go to church and they play the religious game. They'll even bring their Bible and they'll pray to God and they'll even put money in the offering plate. And when they die, they go straight to hell because they never trusted Christ as their Savior. They were trusting all these good things that they do, like that's going to have merit to it. It has absolutely none when it comes to being saved. The only reason I'm not going to hell is because Christ died for my sins. Now look at the next statement. When he makes the statement here in verse 30, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. This is a guarantee. This is eternally being secured. You see, whenever Christ was put on the cross and whenever he is lifted up, even in congregations or individually or whenever you read a track or a book that exalts Christ and what he did on the cross, yet when he was actually put on the cross and lifted up, that's where he made the statement, I will draw all men. And when people, you can be drawn, and there's light that God gives, and he draws with light, and light is the evidence that there is a God. And if you'll follow the evidence, it will always lead to the source of those of that evidence. And you can trust Christ as your Savior. But it says, no man can come unto the, me except it were given him of my Father. Well, what he's talking about is simply, you see, when you're born again, you're born of God, the Father. He becomes your Father. Jesus doesn't become your Father. God becomes your Father. You're born of God, born of the Spirit. And so that new birth, when you're born into God's family, God says, all them that come to the Father, God the Father gives all of us to the Son. And him that are given to the Son, he says, I will never cast you out. I will never lose you. That is eternal security. So when somebody says, I don't believe in eternal security, they don't believe the gospel, the good news that you're saved forever. It's not good news to be saved for a day or an hour or a month or a year. But what if you could be saved forever? If you're going to be saved at all by grace, why can't it be forever then? If he can forgive me of all my sins to give me eternal life, why does he have to take it back? Well, see, he can't take it back. And he promises he will never take it back. This is the only way you can be sure of going to heaven. And Jesus Christ is taking a stand for the security of the gospel. Because that's what the gospel is. And they could not see it. I've witnessed to a lot of people and said, I'll never buy that. I can never believe what you're saying. And I had one person that wrote a track and says, The Damnable Doctrine of Eternal Security. And that was put out by Jimmy Swaggart. He wrote that. And everybody who teaches you can lose your salvation is calling eternal security a damnable doctrine. You need to understand that. Don't you give one penny to anybody who teaches you can lose your salvation. They are not of God. It's not of God. It's in contradiction to everything Christ did and what he stood for and what he preached. Now look what else he says. When he says in verse 39, you'll notice there's a, a little bit of a, well, I guess you could say, a, all that the Father giveth me, Christ, and you come to Christ because of the drawing of the Holy Spirit. You see that there's a trinity here. But also I wanted you to look there now in verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Eternal security is the Father's will. And Jesus said, I'll never lose you. He's going to keep the Father's will. And I'll never cast you out and I'll never lose you. Verse 39. The Father only gives believers to the Son. And that's the promise. You often wonder, well, what does Christ get out of this? He gets us. And when he says he gets us, it's because, you see, we are the church becomes the bride, and we are the bride of Christ. So when Christ takes a wife, she has to be perfect to live forever. And only the new birth can make you perfect. In your new birth, it is perfect. That's what makes it possible for us to go to heaven 
and to be joined together eternally with the Father. <coughs> Look here in verse 39. This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all, all which he hath given me, I should lose how many? Of all of those that the Father gives to me that were born of God, I will lose nothing. I'll never cast them out. I'll never lose. This is eternally secure. Why is he putting this in the Bible if it's not eternal security? If it's not eternal security, it shouldn't be here. In verse 40, And this is the will of him that sent me that every one, you ought to underline those words, every one, up there in verse 39, all, up there in verse 37, all, everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him, they have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. This is a promise from God that we have eternal security. That's the purpose of this. This is why Jesus made the statement, does this offend you? You see over there in verse 61, and when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? Does eternal security offend you? Because you see, if you taught what everybody else teaches, that everybody's, well, you know, good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. Well, everybody knows that. Well, if we taught that, <clears throat> who's going to persecute us? Because everybody believes that. But it's not the gospel. What offends people is this teaching on eternal security. That once you're saved, you're safe forever. And that once you're saved, I don't have to make any promises or pledges to God that I will serve him. Because that would be strings attached to the free gift. And if I don't perform this, then he's going to take this away from me. See, God says, eternal security. That is the key. And this is what he's talking about. And this is what he is defending. Once you're saved, you're what? Always saved. I didn't make up this doctrine. Because I want to go out and live like I please. So I need a good doctrine to let me know that I'm still going to make it. Even though I can just go out here and do whatever I want to do. And live however I want to please. Did you know if you can't say you can live as you please and still go to heaven. You don't believe the gospel. Because the gospel is not tied to how I live. I can trust Christ as my Savior today and live like the devil for the rest of my life. And still go to heaven. And if a preacher won't take and own up to that and say that's true. He ain't worth the quarter. Because he'll have a multitude of verses. He's got a twist. And so, well, that really doesn't mean that. That means this. Because they don't understand it. Because you can't understand how you can be eternally secure without twisting verses. And the only way they can twist them is you've got to make a person be responsible for his salvation because of the way he lives. Look at else. So he makes a statement down here in verse 42. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? What did they say wrong in that verse? What was anything wrong in this? Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Anything wrong in that? A couple things in there is wrong in it. So they didn't discern it. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph? Is that true? They were, they were false. They're trying to say that Jesus is the son of Joseph. And then it says that his father and mother, Joseph was not his father. And that's why they said, uh, we be not born of fornication like you are. They knew. They knew his mother and father. Or I should say his uh, earthly so-called dad, but he was not his father. He didn't father him. Now look at verse 44. No man can come to me except... The Father which hath sent me, draw him. So nobody can come unless they're drawn. And you're drawn by the gospel. You see, when you read in the book of 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, and he called us by the gospel. So we go into all the world and we tell people about this message, and that message draws. But some people will reject the gospel even though they've heard it, but there's a drawing power to it. And there's evidence that God has left everywhere that he is who he claims to be. And people don't have to believe it. But it says, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. 
And I will raise him up at the last day. Now, he said this for a reason. He said this because he knew who would believe and who would not believe. And because they did not believe on him, he knew that they were not of the Father. Because all those that accept the fathers and that gospel about his son come to Christ. And if you don't come to Christ, you didn't believe the message. You might hear it, but you didn't come to it. Now, look what he says here in John chapter 6, in, chapter, in verse 63. Here is salvation by faith and salvation by works. That's always the issue when it comes to salvation. It is the Spirit that quickeneth or makes alive. That is salvation by the Holy Spirit. So Galatians explains the same thing. How is it that you have become so foolish? You began in the Spirit, but you're now made perfect by the flesh. You received Christ as your Savior because you saw, I'm a sinner, I cannot save myself, so I trust Christ as my Savior. So to be made alive and have eternal life, he says, is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profit how much? That's what he was trying to get them to see. They're laboring for something that cannot produce. It cannot produce satisfaction. It cannot give them eternal life. They don't have any discernment whatsoever. But they were following Christ. They followed him to the other side of the lake. They had eaten all this Wonderful, real, physical bread. But it was a miracle that didn't cause them to believe. But it was enough because of the food to their little bellies to want to follow him. It intrigued them. But they didn't get it. A lot of people can hear the gospel and they can get it out, but sometimes we struggle to get it across. Did you get what I said? And as a lot of people talk about, yeah, you've got to be saved. You've got to trust Christ as Savior. Well, we're all saved by grace. Only through faith. Where are you going to die? Well, hell, if I don't change. They don't get it. And they say all the Christian words. I'm talking about preachers are doing this. They don't get it. Now look what he says here in verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. He's trying to get them to see trusting in your works cannot produce the new birth. It cannot give you this eternal life. You cannot have this bread where you'll never have to eat again. You cannot have the water that will quench your thirst for all eternity. You can't have it. Flesh can't give that to you. Only through Christ. And they reject Him as Savior. They didn't mind a few little miracles along the way. Now look what he says in verse 64. But there are, get this, some of you that believe not. So does he know that he's got some unbelievers in his crowd? Yes, he does. So what is the purpose of everything he's saying to do is to get them to um, believe. Some of you haven't believed. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he says, therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except he were given unto him by my Father. That's why I said that over there in verse 44. When he says in verse 44, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. The ones that he raised up the last day, that's those who trust Christ as your Savior. See that there in verse 40? And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's the same as in verse 44. But when you don't believe, you don't receive. And therefore, he says to his disciples, he says, will you also go away? Look what he says here in verse 65. Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Only the ones that can be given to the Son by the Father is those that believe. And if you don't believe, you're not born of God the Father, and the Father cannot give you to the Son, and you do not have eternal life. You can hear all the words, go through the motions, play your religion. You can give money in the offering plate. 
You can sing in the choir. You can do all kinds of good things. But none of those things adds up to salvation. Salvation is nothing that you can do to earn it. You cannot work your way to heaven. Salvation is the gift of God. And it's only by faith in what Christ did for you, not what we do for him. A lot of difference. Now look what he says in verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more. So you're a disciple if you're walking with him and listening and learning, but that doesn't mean you're saved. And he says, and they walked no more with him. Some of the most regrettable words. Because it won't save. When, look at this. And walked no more with him. Because it won't save. They maybe finally understood. That my works according to him won't save me. So I'm not walking no more with him. And they went their way. And never did again. Now, he says this in 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe. We believe. They did not believe. They could not get that salvation is not by your words. <coughs> because if they had got that, they would have accepted Christ as their Savior. But because they would not, because they could not see. That's why the Bible says, like John 5, 24, He that heareth my word and believeth. Some people can hear the word and not believe. They don't get it. They don't understand. Now, I want you to look there at the top of the page on, well, if you've got the right kind of Bible, old school for reference Bible we use. I want you to look at this. <coughs> look in verse 45. As it is written, or it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. So every man has to hear and come to Christ. And if you do, then you receive the free gift of everlasting life. And what I like about this is it says in verse 45, As it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God, every man... Therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. So we have to hear that. And that's mentioned in the Old Testament about people coming to Christ. Look what else he says. Verse 46. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. When, according to what Jesus is trying to explain to him. Not to trust in the works. Because if you trust in your works, when do you receive eternal life? Never. But if you trust Christ as your Savior, when do you receive eternal life? That moment. He that believeth in me hath, present tense, right now, hath everlasting life. So when are you supposed to get eternal life? The very moment you believe. The very moment you believe. You got it. You see, so the key is, when do I get this bread that I'll never thirst? And when do I get this drink of water that I'll never have to thirst or hunger <coughs> for the bread? When? If you'll believe it now, you got it. You have eternal life. So then he goes to a whole dissertation here about an illustration of how to have eternal security. And he uses his body, the flesh, and the, the blood and he that believeth in me is a, he that eateth my flesh. That's the bread you'll live forever. Drink my blood. That's the, the one that you'll have everlasting life. And so he goes down to here and he explains this. I just want you to see this very quickly. Look at verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You don't have any life without me. So you can do all the works, try to keep the law, but that's why in the book of 1 John, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, because you accepted Christ 
It's like eating the, the literal flesh or the drinking the blood of, of Christ. He says, you have this eternal life because he is eternal. Now get this. He says in verse 54, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, get this, hath what? Hath eternal life. Now, the Bible does not contradict itself. So when it says, if you'll drink my blood or, or eat my flesh, can't be any different than as many as received him to them gave he the free gift of everlasting life. It means you come to Christ. It means you trust in Christ as your Savior. Because you can't have two ways to get saved. But you can have many ways explaining what he means by that. And they still could not get it. So you look down here in, uh, where he says there in verse 54, hath eternal life. Now look down there in verse 58. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread, and you underline the next three words, what? Shall live for what? Shall live forever. They ate bread and they're dead. And these, you're laboring for that what doesn't satisfy. You're trying to work your way to heaven and it won't work. You can't be saved by the flesh. And that's why he says in verse 63, it is the spirit that giveth life. Not the flesh. Flesh profiteth nothing. So that's why he says here in verse 60, many Therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Who can understand this? <clears throat> when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said, Does this offend you? Is this explanation on eternity? If you had gotten what he's talking about, this would not be so offensive. It offends people because they don't get it. Because, see, when people think you're saved by how you live, and then you come in and tell them it's all by grace, it has nothing to do with how you live. Because if it is by grace, it can't be by how you live. And you'd be surprised. I bet there's people who come to Calvary Community Church and still don't get it. You might like my personality, the way I comb my hair. But... I agree with Yankee on blah, 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 but you know that thing on Thursday. God knows who believes. You can fool me. You can't fool him. Have you really accepted Christ as your Savior? Are you trusting him to take you to heaven? Or are you trusting your good works? I told a person one time, I said, you don't believe you're trusting your works? No, I'm, not, I'm trusting Christ alone. I said, let's take all of your good deeds that you do. All of your good deeds, and let's take them all away. And all you got left is Jesus. Is that enough? Well, I, mean, I think you ought to help. You don't get it. It's not that he's, he's necessary. He's enough. He's enough. And all you have to do, it's the only thing you can do. Jesus taught eternal security. And this was this whole chapter Deals with this one thing. When I saw that, I liked a bust of the gut. I was sitting up there at Burger King with my Bible and my little piece of paper that I got. And I was doing some things, and I said, does this offend you? Why were they so offended? Because they didn't believe in eternal security. That's what this whole thing's talking about. And when you read it and you study it, it is. He's, he's trying to get them to understand, once you're saved, you're always saved. But you can never be saved by your works. And it can't guarantee you that you're going to make it because it depends on you. Then who's saving who? Any man who's trying to work his way to heaven is trying to earn it. Take away all of your works. Now, can I still go? I'll put it this way to you. This ought to knock your socks off. I had a man call me up one day. He says, can a Christian be a practicing homosexual? He was setting me up. I'm supposed to answer this question. Can a Christian be a practicing homosexual? 
I says, absolutely. <gasps> they go into cardiac arrest. And I've had other people ask me, says, can somebody like Hitler, who killed millions, can Hitler be a Christian? If he ever trusted Christ as a Savior, yes. If you say no, you don't get it. Well, he's too bad. Oh, really? The only way I know that I'm saved is that I can believe he can be saved. Because if God can't save him, how do I know God can save me? Well, I'm better than he is. Find that in the Bible. There is no difference in God's eyes. We have all sinned. And God only requires one simple little thing. That's perfection. And everybody could do that, right? No, if we could, that's the way it would be. But it's not. Look up here. This hand represents you and me. The wallet represents sin. We all have sin on us. Everybody, the worst person in the world, regardless of what he's done, God loves that person just as much as he does anybody else who supposedly does the best. You know, like dear old Aunt Susan, she'd give you the shirt off her back. She goes to church every Sunday, and she's got a car that's 20 years old, and it's only got 20 miles on it. It doesn't matter how good they have been. God loves us. He hates what we do wrong. And the Bible says, because we've done the wrong, we're guilty, and we've got to pay the price, which is eternal separation from God. So there's eternal separation, and there's a way of getting eternal life with the Lord. So God says uh, we have to pay for it. That's eternal separation from God in hell. God loves us and wants us to go to heaven. And to go to heaven, you have to be perfect and righteous as God. None of us are. We have all sinned and come short of God's perfection. So God says we need a Savior. And I cannot save myself. My flesh, me, I cannot deliver myself. I cannot save myself. This hand represents Jesus Christ. God in the flesh, he came into the world because he loves me. Hates my sin because my sin separates me from God. So Jesus Christ, who had no sin, didn't have to die. He took all the sin of all the world, paid for it on the cross, and came back from the dead and said, the only thing that we have to do to go to heaven is believe that he did that for us. And when I believe this, he gives me as a free gift everlasting life. I go to heaven on what he did. And that's forever. I only have to do this one time. Because when I believe this, he puts that payment he made to my account. He don't have to do it again and again and again. Jesus says, once and it's done. He that believeth on me hath, present tense, right now, hath everlasting life. So I know that I'm going to heaven when I die because I don't have any sins to pay for. And he's already given me everlasting life. He did that the day I trusted him, which was 58 and a half years ago. So I got it made. I'm going to heaven when I die. And now because I am God's child and I'm going to heaven when I die, well, I don't want to wait till I get to heaven to praise the Lord. So I'm going to praise him now. I don't have to wait till I get to heaven to sing about him. I'm going to sing him now. And I don't have to wait till I get into the kingdom to serve him. I can go ahead and serve him now. If that's going to be so good, why don't I go ahead and do it now? So I made up my mind, I'm going to serve the Lord now. You know why? Because I love him. Because of what he did for me. I don't have to. But I want to. There's a lot of difference. Do you want your children to love you because they have to or because they want to? You think it through. You know the answer to that. So I, I question people's love for the Lord when they have no desire to serve him because he says, if you love me, serve me. And him that served me, he said, him will my father honor. Anyway, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I think today would probably be a good day to do it. That way you can start off the new year right as a child of God. Let's pray, shall we? With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as Savior, you've heard all about it. You've heard my language. You've heard what God's Word said. You've heard what Jesus said. Will you trust Christ as your Savior? And when you trust him as your Savior, that means he saves you forever and never, you never have to do it again because he can only give you eternal life one time. You can only be born into God's family one time because you can never lose salvation. 
God saves you and saves you forever. And Jesus taught eternal security. With your heads bowed, nice closed. Is there anyone that will say, yes, preacher, that made sense to me, and I will trust Christ right now as my Savior. I want to be sure I'm going to heaven when I die. If you've ever had questions and doubts, why not settle it right now? And if you will make that decision, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to ask you just to slip it up very quickly, put it right back down, that's just so I can have a word of prayer for you. And I'd like to know if what I said made sense to you. Would you just slip your hand up very quickly, put it right back down, anyone at all? Anyone at all? If you've already trusted Christ as Savior, rejoice in the fact that God saves you forever and that you believe once you're saved, you're always saved. If you're watching by Internet, right on the screen, say, yes, I trust Christ as my Savior. I pray that you'll do that. Father, we thank you again for your blessings. Thank you for your words you've given us. We ask your blessings upon each person here. And Father, we do look for a, a great new year, that if you allow us to live and you prolong your coming, we pray that we'll be found faithful in Christ's name. Amen.